So, begin. All right. So, I'm Jonathan Creamer. Uh, I am Jay Creamer and on Twitter. And I'm currently a JavaScript engineer at Append2, doing all kinds of uh, primarily client side. That's pretty much all I do is JavaScript. Um, it's really fun, actually, to do that. Uh, I started out in Cold Fusion a long time ago, and uh, now and then I got into ASP.NET MVC, which kind of naturally led me to JavaScript. Uh, and I started at Pinch about a year ago. Had a lot of fun over there. I love blogging. I blog at several places: NetSuits, TechPro, Fresh Food Code, and then I have a personal blog. And I'll throw all these slides up later so you can get the links and everything. Uh, I'm an IE user agent. It's a program by Microsoft to help promote uh, modern web standards. It's really cool. Go to uh, useragents.ie for more information on that. And then you can go read about me on that bottom link. So, so how many people have actually used RequireJS? Okay, how many people know what it is? Okay, so it's a, it's a good good amount of people who would call themselves advanced RequireJS users. Anybody? So just just a couple. Good. Well, that's good. I kind of want to get a feel for everybody's. Uh, oh no! Also, real quick, let me share my screen so that people watching Google Hangout can actually see what I'm talking about. It's like, okay, screen two. All right. Okay. So. During this talk, the objective is to talk about some traditional JavaScript issues. I don't, I don't want to call them like problems or anything like that. There's kind of some things that make uh, RequireJS useful. Uh, we're also going to talk about how AMD solves those issues. Then at the end, if you want, we can maybe sling a little code around and kind of show it in a, in a real uh, use cases. So here's a few what I call issues in traditional JavaScript. So these days, uh, JavaScript applications tend, uh, this isn't a general rule of thumb, but they're getting larger. Uh, there's just a lot going on with them. Uh, single page applications, you know, you just got lots of JavaScript files flying all over the place. It's no longer just, you know, moving stuff around on the screen. It's, you're, you've got full-fledged apps built with nothing but JavaScript. And uh, so that's just kind of a maintainability problem. Uh, you got to work with, with multiple files. You got to work with you know, all kinds of performance consideration. Uh, so it's not a problem, it's just a thing that's happening in the JavaScript world. Um, so this is another problem with JavaScript, is dependency management. Uh, with, you know, your typical JavaScript page, HTML page, you've got all your script files in line, just one after the other. Uh, and what you've got going on here is, you know, you've got four script tags, and Backbone, for example, if you ever use Backbone, it's a great NB star framework that I highly recommend. Backbone is dependent upon jQuery underscore. So if you take Backbone and you accidentally put it before underscore, Backbone is going to throw a bunch of errors and be like, hey, what's going on? I don't have underscore. This is not right. So you have to flip that around. And it's not like that's a big problem. It's just kind of annoying. And it's, it doesn't feel right to like make your HTML page your dependency loader. Uh, so that's kind of just a little problem uh, with it. Um, and script tags just kind of suck in general because they block your page load, right? If you have JavaScript files in your head, until all the JavaScript files load, your DOMs aren't going to load. You know, so if you have a lot of stuff in your head, you got you can move it to the body and that helps, but then you got the dependency issues. But that's just another small problem. And another thing is, uh, if you put a bunch of inline script tags like this, you're going to have to, like, if you ever want to build and make, like, one single file out of all your JavaScript, you have to go in and replace all the references, do the minification, concatting, and all that stuff. And there's lots of tools to do that, but RequireJS has some stuff to help you do it. So we'll get to that. Uh, another problem with traditional JavaScript is globals. You know, the window, where everybody knows what that is. You know, you've been doing that with forever. Uh, globals cause variable collisions. Um, you can clutter your window with tons of uh, just random variables that you don't want to do that. It's bad. It's a bad practice to use globals. So like, for example, here on this bottom slide, or bottom part of the code here, um, if you have script A, and you say var some variable equals, and you're just, just writing that in your script file, you've just basically done the same thing, saying window dot some variable. Like, you just said, everywhere in my application, in any JavaScript file, I now can use some variable, which is a complete fail, 
Because if anybody else comes in and says, I want to use some variable, well, obviously that's a whole name, but I've seen, I've, I've seen it in practice where, like, this is terrible, but there was, like, var s equals for something that was site-wide for an application it was using. And we used a third-party library that also used var s equals something. And that just causes nasty, nightmarish bugs because you've got to track it down. It's crazy. So that's the kind of a problem with, 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 global, with uh, traditional JavaScript because that's the only way to communicate between files, too. Because if you want script A to talk to B, you have to have a global variable or something, some way of communicating. So globals are the devil. That's, that's basic rule of thumb is don't use them. They, they you know, just make your world not fun. Uh, another problem with traditional JavaScript is that you get into a situation where you'll have these just 20,000, 10,000 line JavaScript files that just became a maintainability nightmare. You're going to just control F all the time, finding things and looking through. And, and, and that's just, I don't know why that happened, but it just kind of does. After a while, you get these large applications, and they're just long and hard to deal with. So this is a guy flipping over a table, in case you've never seen that meeting before. Uh, it, it's, it's not good. It kills kittens and puppies. It's unmanageable. And the better thing to do is to have small modular units of code, which is um, going to help you in many, many different ways. So the solution to these problems is, uh, well, first off, some people decided to get together and talk about these problems. Uh, and an outcome of that was um, CommonJS. I don't know what you call it. It's so a group or whatever. But CommonJS is a group that was set up to create a JavaScript ecosystem for build tools and, and uh, package management and those kinds of things. Uh, and part of CommonJS ended up being creating server-side modules. This is what Node is loosely based on. This is the CommonJS specification. Uh, is to be able to have these small modules of code that the server can load. Um, and you know, so you can break up that 10,000 line file into multiple modules of code. Um, the problem with CommonJS was the way that they did it on the server is it's, it's OK on the server to do synchronous requests. You know, you can say, um, just give me this file, and it goes get it. But in the browser world, you don't usually deal with synchronous code. You use dollar sign that Ajax, you have a callback as asynchronous by default. By design, it is that way. So part of the uh, CommonJS group, part of what came out of it was this thing called Transport C, uh, later became AMD. And AMD stands for Asynchronous Module Definition. Um, so this over here on the right is kind of how uh, a common JS module, this is what a common JS module looks like. So if you're ever using Node.js or anything like this, this is what you'll see. But um, so you'll see this right here. This, just, this is just a synchronous thing. As soon as you say lib equals require package lib, it's going to download that file and have it immediately available right there on the lib, which that's just not ideal for a browser world. Um, so, AMD with RequireJS, uh, uh, there's a, AMD is basically end up being a, a spec uh, that defines a couple things that RequireJS implements. So from the RequireJS docs, you can you can read that the AMD format comes from wanting a module format that was better than today's. You write a bunch of script tags, with implicit dependencies that you have to manually work. So that directly says kind of what I was talking about earlier is rather than having all these big script tags, you'll have a better syntax. Show in just a minute. AMD promotes smaller modules, so rather than 10,000 line files, you have you know 100, 200, and you get to break up your application, and it makes it feel more like a server language like C Sharp or um, Java or anything that has smaller code because you're not dealing with you know these big things, and so your 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 whole mindset kind of changes about how you write JavaScript apps. Um, AMD with require manages your dependencies. Uh, so if module A is dependent on module B, that gets set up for you. The spec defines uh, define and require. Actually, actually, I think it's just really define. I want to change that, but define is how you define a module. Uh, that's it's a, a function that the spec kind of the API requires. Um, and then some of the other benefits in all of required JS is uh, there's a tool that you can optimize your modules. So if you have you know, 50 modules, which is not uncommon, there's this thing that comes with called r.js, and you run it with Node or Java or Rhino, which I don't recommend, but you can. Um, I recommend Node because it's way faster. But you can basically trace all the dependencies in your app and build one JavaScript file that holds your entire application. 
which is better because you can reduce your HTTP requests, you have a smaller file because they are minified, and we'll talk about RWS in a little while. Um, okay. So I'm going to step aside just for a minute. This here is a, is a JavaScript pattern called the revealing module pattern. And it's something that, how many people have seen this pattern before? I mean, yeah, it's a very, very common pattern. Um, the whole idea of it is you have, you're just declaring a, a variable right here. And down here at the bottom, you've got these, you know, you're immediately invoking a fun the function that you just defined. And it's, it's kind of weird in the way that it has it all wrapped up here. But basically what happens is the stuff inside here immediately runs. And whatever you return here is the API for this module. So this module, get in the module, has do it and do it now on there for there. And then the cool thing about it is since you have this uh, iffy, this, this module, um, basically the, the, the variables you declare inside of the curly braces are um, scoped within that function. So you can kind of have private variables in a sense. They're not, they're not really private, but that's kind of how you think of them because this private variable here, the private, is not accessible outside of this if you. So that's just kind of a little thing about modules. And I sh this is good. This works if you can't use RequireJS, your boss hates you and doesn't want you to use it. Um, so that works, and this is a very, very common pattern. And I show that because using RequireJS modules is not a lot different looking than using the revealing module pattern. A lot of people get hung up when they look at RequireJS because it's got all this define and these, these things going on. But in reality, it doesn't do a whole lot more than the revealing module pattern does. The basic idea of it, there's no iffy, it's just a function. And whatever you return is the API for your module. And that's it. And um, the way that the, this module gets named, at least with RequireJS, how RequireJS works, it is basically based on the file name. So if this was in like JS slash app slash module slash module A, the name of this module would be app slash module slash whatever. But you don't have to, in development, you don't have to put in the ID. See, this, is, this up here is, is the spec for define. It's an optional ID. Uh, you don't have to put in the ID because later on when you run the r.js tool, it puts it in for you. And uh, require.js is smart enough that even though you don't have that ID, it knows when you ask for a module where to find it based on the path. So the path kind of its ID, and it'll make more sense here in a second. Um, the second argument is an array of dependencies. And the third argument is a callback so that when this module loads, you run, run the code inside here. Um, so again, in, in, this, in this case, no globals are being exposed here. This is all private. Uh, the only things that get exposed are what you return in this, this object literal down here. So that's another really nice benefit. Um, this module here has no dependencies. So I'll show you now what a module with dependencies looks like. So in this case, um, wow, I'm missing a quote there. Fail. Um, what happens is your first argument to your define call is an array of other modules that this module is dependent upon. So here in this case, it would, it's just literally a path to the module. Uh, so this module here is dependent upon some slash module. And then what happens is when this module gets loaded, it goes and it grabs some slash module and however many other dependencies it has and then brings them all down asynchronously, completely you know, out of order and, and asynchronously. But it loads them all in the order that you ask for them as uh, arguments to your factory function, your callback here. So, so this, this module comes back here as mod in this case. So whatever mod happened to return for its API, you can then use. Um, so say mod had do something on it, you can then use it. Uh, so that's nice because you can ask for a bunch of dependencies and you don't have to, you just don't have to think about it. It's just like, I just, I know I need this, this, and this. So you might need jQuery, your backbone, and underscore, you just ask for those things and they're immediately available in this module. Um, uh, okay, so um, that is defined, and I want to point out that there's uh, there's lots of different ways that you can set up modules. Um, the first here 
It's just a simple object loader where literally I'm just setting up an object and returning that object loader. And again, this ends up being just the API for that module. Whatever you return is what this module exposes as its functions. So that's one way of doing it. Um, another way of doing it is you can actually return a constructor. So in this case, I'm setting up you know, some modules, whatever you need. Uh, you can set up your prototype functions on it, like you would a normal JavaScript constructor. And then you can actually return just the constructor. And this is nice. This is kind of like a class, really, almost. So any other module that depends on this module can actually create an instance of that constructor. Right? So that's kind of one other thing you can do. Uh, another thing you can do is you can actually even return an instance of a constructor. Um, so you can have this sub module, and you can have the same kind of thing, but you can return a new one of it. So instead of returning just the constructor, it returns you, you know, a new whatever of this thing. Uh, which this is nice because if you ever need, <laughs> I've used this before. If I have like a, a state thing that just holds some data from my application, um, I would just call like app dot state or something. And you can say inside of here, it'd be like app dot state equals new whatever. And you can store stuff in here, and only that one instance is shared after your whole application, which is kind of a cool little trick you can use. Um, the last thing you can do is uh, if you have a module that doesn't have any dependencies and just returns an object literal, you can just do that right there. Just define and just return something, and you're done. Uh, you can even also return just a function. You can just say define and just return a function. Uh, there's several different ways of doing it. Uh, OK, <clears throat> so that's the define part of it. Uh, require here is uh, is another thing out of the spec, but it's a little bit different than define. Define is what you use to actually set up and, and define modules. Uh, in require, it has the same signature in that you have um, you ask for an array of dependencies and you get them back in your callback and you can run them. But require is basically just for loading things. You know, it doesn't do anything really other than that. Uh, but you can use require in line. So say you're defining a module, and for some reason you need to load another module like later, like at runtime, you can use require to load that module in. Uh, no. um, the other thing, and this is, this is something that is new to me even. I did not know this until recently. Um, so the inside of this here, uh, if you just ignore the define from it, this looks just like a common JS module. See how it's, there's no array here. It's just a, you know it's just asking for a module. Require JS has this cool thing you can do. If, if you maybe say you're using a node library and you want to import it to the browser, if you just wrap it with this define function and you ask for a require as a callback, you can actually use common JS uh, syntax as well. Um, require JS does some really interesting hackery to make this work. Literally, what it does, if you want to know is that it does a two string on this function and parses out all of your required calls and then sets up a dependency array for you anyway. So if you really like the common JS way of doing things, you can do that as well. Um, it's just a thing to know. Um, all right, so the basic way that you get required JS set up on a page, um, this is kind of how you do it typically on more of a single page application field where you've just got like one JavaScript file and you're not loading a bunch of pages. I mean, you can do this with a multi-page application, uh, but you'll, you know, if you have page code for your about and contact and all your pages, they'll be loaded on every page. But, you know, it's just a thing. Uh, there are ways to do multi-page. Um, I don't talk about it in this talk, but in other talks, there are, are ways that you can do multi-page required JS where you can actually have different um, code depending on what page you're on. Like if I'm on my about page, I don't really want the code for my home page and my about page necessarily. But like I said earlier, a lot of our new JavaScript applications are single page, you know, Twitter, Gmail, these applications that are large things are all single page applications. Um, but anyway, so down here at the bottom, what you'll do to load RequireJS is just point to RequireJS, wherever it is in your directories, and then you have this data attribute, uh, HTML5 attribute, that says the main module I want to load for my app is going to be, you're pointing it to a, a file, script slash main. You don't have to use .js because it's assumed you're going to be doing the JavaScript modules. Um, but that's it, and that's how you, that's how you set up the It's as simple as that. Um, 
So this is what the main, that data that's main, this is the main.js here. Um, what you can do here is uh, you can set up a couple configuration variables. Um, and actually, let me jump back for a minute. So that we have um, this main, I should also point out, since this is kind of the, the place uh, where relative to where your main is, is where your other files are going to live. Right, so if all my scripts are in script slash main slash, or script slash app, since so app slash modules or app slash models or app slash controllers, um, the, wherever your main is, that sets up your base URL. Uh, and that's just something to kind of, kind of be aware of because that can, can catch you in development. You're like, don't understand where things are coming from. You have weird errors with modules not loading. Um, you have everything loads relative to where your main is. Just keep that in mind. Uh, so what I'm doing here is, is you can actually, in your main, you can set up a couple uh, configuration variables. One that's very common is to use this paths. And what paths is, is it's a way to um, alias common modules that you can have all over app, like jQuery here, for example. Um, this would maybe point to like script slash vendor slash jQuery. Uh, and then the bottom one here is if you have like you know some plugin you want to alias it so that you don't have to type app slash model slash your mom slash whatever dot js you can use the that and that and there you're good. This is also really handy because for in this case like if you're using jQuery or, or some version dependent file rather than having to go through everywhere and like replace jQuery dot one dot nine with jQuery dot two dot o you change it in one place and it changes everywhere. This is also really cool for unit testing because if you needed to, you could change one of your paths to some fake or some other thing so that you don't actually load jQuery, you can load some fake jQuery or something. Uh, but anyway, so down here at the bottom uh, is what I was saying before is this is how you kind of typically kick off your app is you'll do a require and you're going to say I want to get my app slash app.js file. No one's done, I want to run my app.init. So this might be what the app JS would look like. Uh, you would ask for jQuery and maybe two other modules. In this case, all the, the modules return are functions, just kind of for brevity. Um, but that's it. I mean, that's that's how you would set up a small, teeny tiny application that does nothing. But that's how you would basically start out on acquire JS applications. Um, and yeah, these are these are examples of the other two modules here. So, so you can see all I'm doing is just returning a function. In both of these, um, it gets executed here, index and about. Um, so another problem that was, I mean, when you're dealing with um, AMD, like you're going to say, well, what about all these libraries that aren't AMD compliant? I mean, not everything wraps itself with a define call as a module. Um, well, fortunately, uh, in one of the newer versions in required JS, they added this thing called a shim. And what this does is up here, I'm asking for Backbone, and Backbone is not AMD compliant. You can't just use it well. You can, you can put it in there, but you'll have all kinds of loading issues because RequireJS doesn't know what to do with it because there's no define call. It doesn't think it's a module. So to get around that problem, there's this shim object. And you basically just kind of, you know, you've got Backbone here. You say, well, here I want to I shim Backbone, and I want to make sure that when you ask for Backbone, you're explicitly saying backbone is dependent on jQuery and underscore. And then the variable that backbone ex or the that the whatever exports is in right here in your exports. So you've got, you know, uh, here underscore, you know, a underscore is not even combined either. So underscore exports underscore. Uh, and it even works, you know, even though I'm shimming underscore here, I can still use it as a dependency of backbone. So that's how you deal with that problem when modules or when uh, libraries are not aimed as a client. Um, this, let me tell you, was not fun to deal with a long time ago. It was so hard to do backbone uh, apps before this shim thing. So praise God that that's there now. Um, all right, so that's kind of the APIs for it. Uh, there's this optimizer thing called r.js uh, that comes with RequireJS out of the box. And what it does is you define this little build file. Uh, it can get a little bit confusing, but a simple one is not that hard to deal with. Um, and what it basically does is it starts with your main, whatever, whatever your main is, 
So in this case, it would just be like date or you know app slash main. And since require.js has all this dependency stuff, the R.js tool, its purposes is it starts at main. It says well, main is dependent upon jQuery and underscore and some module A. Well, some module A is dependent upon some module B, and then it does this whole full dependency tree thing, and it loads all those files in, and it concatenates some and minifies them into a single JavaScript file, or however you want it. There's many different ways of setting it up, but that's what it does. Uh, it, it takes all your JavaScript and gives you one single file for it, or however, however you set it up, like I said. But, um, typically, you would, you'd use it with Node, um, so that's what I would recommend. Um, and then the way you run it is you just say node, and then you give it the path to your R.js, and then give it dash O and point to your app.build, and then it just does its magic. Uh, it's really, really, really handy. So that is Require.js. Um, I don't always write JavaScript, and when I do, I use Require.js. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of Require.js. Um, I, I want to go over some, some code now and kind of show uh, a little bit how it works. In, in actual practice. Um, let's get a nozzle here. I love that picture. Okay, so this is going to be kind of hard. Oh, wow, well, that's not going to work at all, is it? Hang on. Yeah, that's not going to work at all. Come on. Okay. And okay. So, uh, how many people have heard of Yaleman? Anybody heard of Yaleman? Cool. Obviously. So, um, a couple of days ago, I just basically said um, I used Node, and there's a. Um, is it going to show me here? For those of you who don't know what Yaleman is, uh, it's basically a way to just build an application in like two seconds. There's on NPM, there's a lot of generators where you can say, I want to have a Require.js app, I want a backbone app, you know, I want an HTML5 boilerplate app. And you basically just say yo and give it the name. Yeah, see, here's the ones I have installed. Um, you would basically go in and, and install Yale first, and then you can install these different generators like Require.js, and then you would say yo Require.js app and then run it. And then that's going to download just a bunch of stuff and get you up and running in two seconds. I'm not going to run it right now because it takes a couple minutes, but um, I say that to say that's how I generated this. So all this code in here, and I've got this on GitHub, um, is just a real basic starter for how to use Require.js. Uh, I'll just kind of show you real quick how it's set up. So just like I was showing before, you've got this. Uh, is, this is this okay for everybody back there, by the way? See you. Let me see you. Let me see you. Let me see you. Um, so here I've got an app slash config is my main, and then uh, Yeoman uses Bower, which is a client side version of NPM, and it installs everything into this components directory. Um, so that's where my required yes is. So you can see that app slash config is where I've got my main, and, and this is my main hanging out here. Uh, I'm defining where all my vendor components are for. You can also kind of um, this is kind of alias as a path too. You can do that also. I kind of forgot to mention that, but you can also alias a path. Um, and then, uh, if I'm not testing, this this particular scaffold comes with some unit testing stuff, which is really neat also. Um, but if I'm not testing when I'm running this thing, it says require my main, and then this is what the main looks like. Right now, I'm just requiring jQuery and underscore um, to show just how it works. Um, but what's cool about this whole Yaman thing is I can say uh, it, it's built on top of Grunt, which is a, a task runner for JavaScript. If you've never used that, another thing I highly recommend. You can do pretty much anything in the world you want to do with it. I'm using Grunt to build CK editor right now. I'm using Grunt to um, run all my unit tests. Uh, it, it does minification, concatenating. It even, in this case, runs the R.js tool. Um, Right here, what I'm going to do is run a preview, and it's going to spin me up a little server that I can. So right now, I'm at local let's say 1,000. I can come up here, and you know, there it is running. Uh, so that's you know, this is a very very simple way to just get started real fast. So you just run yo require js colon app. Um, let me see what else is there to talk about this thing. Um, 
mean, I could keep going and adding modules, but I mean, that's basically my talk. So um, well, maybe in the, I'll just show our last slide here, kind of give you some concluding thoughts. Uh, the app is, or the sample app is up there. Of course, if you install Yeo, then you can do this all yourself. But if you want to just go check it out sooner, there it is right there. Um, again, I'm Jake Cream right now on Twitter, and that's it. Thank you guys for listening to my talk. Anybody have any previous questions or concerns? No pressure. Just curious. Cool deal. Well, I guess I'll trip up and say that um, the syntax that he shared, where you um, you basically specify require as the only dependency to a uh, closure that you're passing through another require, it's a little confusing. But you can basically copy paste the entry point for any node app yeah. into that closure, and then it will just, I mean, as long as you point it to the right place, um, it'll work. then it will run that node app in the browser. So it really makes, I mean, a lot of node developers are like, man, I really want to run my new, my new step in the browser. Yeah. But that's all you really have to do. And if you're, if that's too complicated for you, there's another uh, uh, node project that's that's built on required JS or it takes a lot of uh, Used from a podcast called Browser Fine uh, that, that does a lot of the same stuff. Cool. Anybody else have any questions about it? I did, uh, I did some research on the require library about a month and a half or two ago. Um, and I looked at uh, about half a dozen of them. How would you compare require to stuff like yep node or fan.js or head.js? Um, are those ones actual A and D loaders? Because I know that there's, what is that? I can't remember the other one. There's another um, actual AMD one. But I know um, Head, I think, just basically loads files asynchronously. It doesn't actually do the AMD stuff. Um, but there are a couple other AMD compliant libraries. I can't remember what they're right now. But anyway, um, this one, in comparison to the other ones I've looked at, it's just a, it's got a lot of nice stuff. Like that CommonJS stuff, not everybody has that. Um, that's a really nice to have. It's not like you're going to use it every day, but it's like sometimes you're like, oh, I kind of want to use a CommonJS module, and that's good to have. The optimizer is one of my favorite pieces of it. Um, I can run it real fast. It takes forever uh, right now for some reason. I think because I'm doing the Google Hangout. It doesn't usually take this long. This is what it looks like. Um, I would run Grunt. Actually, this one's just Grunt. So this will kind of show you what Grunt does, too. Um, Grunt, see how I just linted all my files. Uh, this is what Grunt's doing. I just concatenated them all. Oh, it's going really fast this time. Uh, so this is the part where the required JS optimizer is running. So you can see what it what it did is it started tracing my dependencies, and it found jQuery underscore and main and config, and those are all the dependencies in my app. And it did, did that just by you know following along with my modules, which is really really handy. And then what it's doing here is it's concatenating them all together, and then it's uglyfying, so minifying, and you know making this one small file and requiring in JS. Uh, anyway, that'll keep running for a minute. Uh, but that's that's one of my favorite pieces of requires the optimizer because uh, there's no better way to just take a bunch of files and make them as one for for production for distribution. So yeah, there it is. So it took all it took it uncompressed of this and minified it all the way down to that. So that's pretty impressive, really. Three hundred seventy nine k down to twenty five k gzip. So that's that's what requires you. It buys you just out of the box. You know, you don't have to do anything hardly. Especially if you use the AMN. If you use the AMN and you spin up an app and you just go with it, you can. I mean, it, this comes. You just run run until you're done. Um, so that's kind of why I wanted to show this all that that AMN thing just to get everybody to the point where you can just start and go. Because there's a little bit of hang up sometimes with getting started. It's really easy with this AMN stuff. So, you know, anybody can do it in two minutes. So. If there's no more questions, we'll just kind of hang out and have some fun and eat more food and drink more beer, I guess. We're out of the food beer. Oh, well, let's just <laughs> talk more jobs. Oh, what's up? I had a question. That uh, preview task that you shared with Brian. Yes. Uh, no, it's so, I'll show you. It's, um, in this case, it's just uh, run. No, well, it's, it's, it's built in here. Uh, let's see. It's using a connect server. And so basically, I mean, that's it. It just it just runs a connect server and spins up, serves up whatever's in your in your project directory. 
So, and then down here at the bottom, you can see where I've got my task set up. Yeah, so does it, my question, I guess, is does it, um, how does it handle, like, if you're doing Common Script or, like, uh, like, if you're using less or Compass or something like that, where you need, you need to process your files and files? Um, for Grunt, uh, my, I, haven't, I haven't, don't do a lot of Common Script, but there's pretty much, a, if you can think of something you want to do with Grunt, somebody has probably already done it. Is, is pretty much the rule of thumb. So I can guarantee you that if you go to gruntjs.com and you look at the plugins, somebody has a grunt coffee script plugin. There's probably one, all these grunt dash contribs are like the, the main ones that the people who write grunt make. So any of the other ones is probably grunt coffee script stuff uh, all over the place. But that's how it would work, is, is you would have a task and it would, you'd, you'd, you'd load it in, it'd be, I'm just guessing here, but it'd be something like, um, you know, load npm grunt coffee script, and then down here in your task run, where you specify what task you want, you have like coffee or whatever. Yeah, what I've done in the past is it like it'll compile this to the temp directory, and then your next server will actually start out of the temp directory. Oh, yeah, and that, yeah. Watch task watch. Yeah. I just didn't know if that preview would do built in that. No, no. No, well, that's, it came with the new scaffolding thing, but yeah, nothing weird that going on there. So, okay, cool. Well, thanks, guys. This was fun.